the great pleasure of having uh, here with us Professor uh, Jörg Guido Hulsman, who uh, lectures uh, uh, at the Faculté de Droit, Économie et de Gestion, Université d'Angers in France. Um, and uh, he's a professor of economics. Uh, he's also a senior fellow of the Ludwig von Mises Institute uh, in uh, Auburn, Alabama, United States of America. His uh, main research areas are political economy of financial markets, theory of money and banking, and the conceptual and philosophical problems of economic analysis. He has been awarded many distinctions, uh, and uh, uh, he has uh, uh, many important uh, degrees. Uh, he has uh, his, uh, uh, I will say the English version now, competitive entrance exam as full professors professor of French state universities. Uh, he had his uh, uh, habilitation or as a research director certificate for French state universities from Université of Paris Dauphine. Uh, and he had his PhD from the Technical University of Berlin in Germany in 1996. Um, he has been a visiting professor uh, uh, in many universities. He has been invited as key speaker in many places, uh, and uh, uh, most importantly, his work comprises, as a very important member of, of uh, the Austrian School of Economics, a number of, uh, uh, of books and many, many articles. Among the books that uh, he has written, um, we find the one uh, that has been launched uh, uh, in uh, Yash, uh, yesterday, and it is uh, again launched in Bucharest today, The Ethics of Money Production, of course in the Romanian translation. Um, he also is uh, the author of the great uh, biography of Ludwig von Mises, The Last Night of Liberalism. Uh, he's author of Deflation and Liberty, uh, a little book that is also available in Romanian translation uh, uh, as of now. Um, and uh, he has written many other important uh, books and articles. Uh, I will no longer insist on his very impressive CV. I will just give him the floor uh, uh, to speak about financial markets and the state. Professor Hilsman. Thank you very mu uh, much for this very nice uh, introduction. I hear that in Romania you are preparing for uh, Tax Freedom Day, which is the day in the year as from which, from uh, an accounting perspective, you no longer pay taxes. So until, let's say, if Tax Freedom Day is tomorrow, then until May 16, every single uh, euro or uh, whatever other currency that you, that you work for, has uh, you have earned as revenue, has been shifted directly over in the form of taxes to the state. And as from May 17, then, uh, the remaining revenue that you earn belongs to you, so can remain on your bank account or under your pillow or where, wherever you keep it. Now, uh, it's, it's a common way to measure the importance of the state as uh, uh, by, by current revenue. What has been neglected is the, the impact on the, of the state on financial markets. That is uh, 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 lacuna that not only concerns uh, well, standard economic analysis, we find in, in major textbooks, but also concerns those economists or those schools of economic thought that have been most critical of the, of the state, in particular the Austrian school, uh, on which I uh, base myself. So the paper that I will present tonight, and it's actually not yet completely written, but you get at least a PowerPoint presentation, you get the main gist of the idea, is to have a closer look at uh, the different ways in which governments uh, have recourse to what I call financial market interventionism, which seeks to increase the amount of revenue that the government can obtain beyond the, the amount of revenue that it would otherwise obtain. We'll start off by first considering uh, the role of financial markets according to the conventional theory. And in the conventional theory, which again lacks this point of view that we will develop tonight, conventional theory, the role of financial markets is to uh, assure the financing of companies, essentially, and also to a, to a minor extent of governments. 
So the financial markets are the ways companies finance themselves and therefore play a crucial role within the market economy. So we'll first go through some of the elements of the, the reasons why this sort of intermediation should be particularly important and then look at some pieces of empirical evidence that somehow dis disturb this, this picture, that don't fit quite into this picture, and raise questions concerning uh, the, the reasons for which government involvement with financial markets is actually much, much bigger than it appears according to conventional theory. And then in the third section, we'll deal with financial market interventionism, which would be an approach, an explanation of these phenomena, and then finally conclude uh, on the uh, different implications of this financial market interventionism. So, according to the co uh, conventional uh, theory of financial markets, uh, before we even get there, let me just uh, make one fundamental observation about the, the role of financial markets. I mean, um, financial markets uh, are or have two types of general consequences, namely that they uh, influence the use of present and future uh, resources and provide incentives for larger savings. The first, I think, the most fundamental point that needs to be stressed, and I will go gloss over this very fast because you're all economic students, is that financial markets and credit in particular do not create resources. And it's not because we extend the amount of credit that we enrich ourselves. What financial markets do and what credit does in particular is to transfer resources from one end of the economy to another. And so there are then different uses of uh, real resources, labor, raw materials, intermediate products, than otherwise, both in the short run and in the long run. And of course, we hope that this will be bring about an improved use of, of those very resources. And if the use is improved, this means that we have a higher return on our investment, a higher both real and, and, and value term, both in real and value terms, well, then we will be able to invest more in the future. We'll have more resources in the future. So this is the possible role that financial markets can play. Uh, so from the outside, it's, it's important to not to fall into some kind of magic conception of the financial markets, right? The, high, the, 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 the more important our financial markets, the better it is, right? There's something like an optimal size of financial markets in the economy. So financial markets uh, therefore provi provide also incentives for larger savings, right? If uh, financial markets help us to obtain a higher return on our investment, both in monetary and in real terms, well, then we have uh, incentives to save more and can then use more resources in the future. So let's turn now to the macroeconomic benefits of financial markets according to the conventional theory. And what we find here are five typical arguments. Right? Financial markets help to pool savings. Uh, they increase the liquidity of our savings. They provide information about uh, investment opportunities. They help us to smooth our consumption in the life cycle. Right? It's no longer necessary for us, for example, if you want to build a house as a university graduate, it's no longer necessary that you first walk through a valley of tears and save for 20 years and then finally you buy, buy your little dacha somewhere in the countryside, but you can obtain a credit right away and buy your little house right away. Right? So no need to uh, reduce your consumption now in order to uh, obtain greater consumption in the future. And uh, fifthly, Financial markets are also instrumental in the reorganization of uh, our industries. Right? Uh, entrepreneurs can uh, obtain a majority position in, within companies by buying sufficiently, uh, a sufficient amount of shares and then uh, steer the companies onto paths, onto new paths, change the management, and so on. The pooling of saving concerns both uh, the volume and the risk taking, and all of this gives us then more incentives to save. Right, so if we come back to the, the basic point that I mentioned before. Right, so these uh, five different forms of uh, uh, macroeconomic benefits actually can be subsumed in the uh, two basic mechanisms that I mentioned before, namely a greater 
uh, incentive to save and the promise of a better use of savings. Right? So the co conventional theory fits, well, nicely, let's say, into a classical economic outlook uh, of the economy. It's just a more detailed uh, exposition of the different aspects through which financial markets create greater incentives to save and create better uses of savings. And as a consequence of better uses, of course, there are even more incentives to save. Now, having this in mind, then so we, we see, right, so the conventional theory turns very uh, strongly about the productive use of savings, uh, especially the productive use of savings in, in firms, uh, especially non-financial firms. So having this in mind, let us now consider a few pieces of uh, empirical evidence that do not really fit into this, this picture. First piece of evidence is a look on uh, the German capital market as far as the issues of uh, equity securities are concerned, so shares, right, company shares. So what we see here is, uh, so I only have the years 2006 and 2007 because uh, contrary to the Greek statistical office, the Germans are very sluggish. Okay, so the, the last data, that <laughs> macro data that we have for Germany are for 2007. We all wonder why, but it's not the subject of my lecture. Whereas we do have data for Greece for 2011. Also for the US for 2011. And I guess for Italy too, but I didn't look it up. Okay, so here we are the data for 2006 and 2007. So what we see here is that um, in 2006, nine, for 9 billion euros, uh, new st uh, shares were, were issued by German firms, both uh, financial, non-financial. Okay, 2007 was 10 billion dollars excuse me, 10 billion euros, both financial and non-financial firms. Uh, investment fund uh, shares, uh, you see the volume is more important, but investment funds in a way are less interesting for us because investment funds, well, what do they do? Well, well they, they buy either real estate or they buy uh, securities, and securities, so they can only buy the securities that have been issued, right, by non-financial firms. Right, so these issues of uh, investment funds, right, investment shares, is, is, is less relevant for us. So the stock market uh, capitalization, well, I don't need, need to go into this. So we keep in mind these two figures, around 10 billion euros right, of financing comes through the financial market. The stock cap uh, market capitalization represents not uh, new financing, but it represents ownership. Right. The existing securities, uh, so have already been paid into the companies in previous years. Uh, so now this is a current, a present value of, in 2006, uh, 1,279 billion euros. Uh, so it represents the, the aggregate value of all shares that previously have been issued uh, and so paid into the companies. So this is uh, right, the, the, the financing of all companies through financial market in the, the previous time. Actually, the figure is larger than the actual financing of the companies because the stock market capitalization right, even goes up uh, uh, after the issue of a share. Right? The, the share itself might have been issued for 100 euros and thereafter on the secondary market, its price increases maybe to 200 euros. Right? So then the stock market capitalization would be 200, but the, the amount of money that the company actually has received was only 100. Okay. Now, second piece of uh, information, if we look now on uh, fixed income securities, so this is debt. Right? So what we see here uh, is again the German capital market is that non-corporates, excuse me, uh, non-financial corporates have issued uh, in 2006 a for 8 billion euros uh, debt uh, instruments and in 2007 for 20 billion. And uh, I also highlighted the, the total volume, right, of, of new issues on, on the German market. It's uh, so 242, respectively, 217 billion euros. You, we see that uh, in the years running up to the crisis, right, 2006 and 2007, the, the lion's share of this uh, was issued by foreign debtors. Right? So you have the usual, probably a lot of this by the, by the Greek government, right? The Greek government uh, floated in Germany uh, Greek government bonds sold them to German uh, bond buyers right, on the German market. Also the Italian government and the French government, etc., etc. So we keep in mind so, right, the, the figure, eight, uh, let's say 20 billion euros comes 
from uh, fixed income securities, right? two firms. So we have around 10 for equity and 20 billion uh, for fixed income. Okay? That's how much money German firms obtained in those years through the financial market. Now let's have a look at aggregate spending and revenues in Germany of the German economy. Uh, it's customary today under the impact of, of Keynesian thought to only look uh, at GDP figures. So in, in the first three columns of uh, this chart, I give you GDP figures. Right? We, have, we have the total, right? German GDP in 2006 was, was 2,327 billion euros. And out of this uh, total, um, gross capital of formation, both private and public, represented 410 billion euros. Okay. Uh, consumer expenditure uh, represented 1,752 billion euros in 2006. Right, so if we ju just look at GDP, we, we get the impression that actually the economy right, is, is driven by consumer expenditure and that uh, investment expenditure is, is, uh, is a function anyway is, is, is lower than consumer expenditure because firms can only invest what they have received as revenue before. Right? So the conventional Keynesian picture. Now we need to enlarge this picture in order to get closer to the real world by also considering the other forms of investment expenditure being carried out by firms. There are two other main forms of investment expenditure, namely spending on intermediate goods and uh, spending on labor, so the compensation of employees, which is a category that uh, involves both the cash payments uh, to employees, so the money that ends up on their bank account, and the contributions to so social security systems and taxes directly paid by the company to the state. Okay. So, the, for example, you see in 2006, the uh, compensation of German employees, or well, not German, but uh, residents, right, was 1,149 billion euros. And so it was not the case that all this money ended up on their bank accounts, but it was, was about 60% of this, or probably not even 55%, right? 45% was being withheld, right? But anyway, was being paid by the companies. So is an investment from the point of view of the companies. So what we need to do in order to get a grip on, uh, right, some empirical impression on the investments being made by German companies in the year 2006 is to add up the different types of investment expenditure. Not only spending on fixed capital goods, so it's the 410 billion euros, but also spending on intermediate products, which was 2,170 billion euros, and spending on labor, which was 1,149 billion euros. So this gives us a total investment expenditure by residents, right, German residents, of 3,729 billion euros in the year 2006, and 3,944 billion euros in the year 2007. So it's the last column. And you see, of course, these figures alone should highlight that there's something deeply wrong with the conventional Keynesian account of the operation of the macroeconomy. Even if we accept for the moment the notion held by Keynes that the economy is driven by money spending, right, then it certainly is not driven by consumer spending. And that's what we see here. Consumer spending is just about, it's actually less than a third in those years, less than a third of total expenditure. But for us, we're not tonight interested in, in Keynesian economics. Um, was my subject yesterday in Yash, at the University of Yash. Uh, today we're interested in financial markets in the state. So we're interested in the question, how important are financial markets in financing German companies? German companies who have spent in the year 2007, 3,944 billion euros to create products. And we have just seen that German companies in that same year obtained about 10 billion euros through the stock market and obtained about 20 billion euros by issuing fixed income securities. You do the math, right? We get some, some 30, trillion, excuse me, 30 billion euros, which is, uh, if we look at if this, was less than 1%. Okay? Less than 1% of all the spending, investment spending, being carried out by companies. 
So where does the rest come from? Well, it's not a big miracle. Well, the rest comes essentially from selling products. Okay, it's the revenue of companies that they reinvest. If a company has a revenue, let's say, of one million euros and it reinvests 950, so the, the owner of the company keeps, keeps 50,000 for himself, right, to buy the swimming pool or I don't know what, then these 950 that he reinvests are actually savings investments, right, and they are coming out of, out of his current revenue. Uh, so that's the main source of financing of industry. Now, of course, there are also forms of credit involved, most notably commercial credit right, that you get from suppliers uh, as a two-month credit. But that's, again, it's, it's, a, uh, it's more important than the money that comes through the financial markets. Right? But it's not, it's not that sum, right? Commercial credit is about 200 billion euros or something like this. So the bulk of financing is coming from selling products. It's generated by the operation of the firms themselves. Financial markets do not play a secondary role. They play a role that is virtually nil in financing German companies. Now, that doesn't mean that financial markets might not fulfill the other roles that we highlighted before. For example, the role that consists in re industrial reorganization. Right? It's still possible right, to buy shares from the, the present owners of the shares right? and thus build up a majority position uh, and then once you have the majority position, you are running the company, right? You're changing the management or you're uh, realizing a new strategy and so on, right? But that's not financing the company. It's not because you buy the shares from the present owners that you are financing the company. You're financing the guys who sell you the shares. It's a different thing. So the question then is, uh, what are financial markets... Well, good for, except for industrial reorganization. And my, my argument tonight is that they are, uh, to a very large extent, a vehicle for financing the state, a vehicle for giving government greater revenue than, they, than it otherwise would have had. And of course, it doesn't, doesn't right, contradict the conventional theory of uh, financial markets. This, I think this theory is correct. It just relativizes this. The conventional theory is correct, but it gives us uh, only a very minor part of reality, whereas the bigger part of the, of the story is probably to be looked for somewhere else. So let's have a, uh, in order to, uh, to see then the, the, the relative role of government in financial markets, let's have a look at uh, financial assets and financial uh, liabilities, uh, first in the German case, and we'll, we'll generalize a little bit. So I've put here this chart of uh, giving us uh, net financial savers and net users of financial savings. Financial savings is a somewhat awkward exp uh, expression, right? This is my term, <laughs> financial savings. Because you can save otherwise, there's no other terminology. Right? You can save otherwise, you can save in cash, for example. Right? You can save by buying uh, some real estate, by buying a house. You put your savings into the house. It's what most families do. But it's not financial saving. So here we have financial savings, actually financial investment. A financial saving consists in buying some asset. Okay. So it's the capital market, or the financial market. So if you look at uh, just at the financial market and ask, well, who is providing the savings? And who is using the savings? Right? So this is the picture that we see for Germany. Right? So we see then that uh, households and, and non-profits have a net position of 2,902 billion euros. That is, households and non-profits provided 2,902 billion euros more resources to the financial markets than they obtained from the financial markets. Right? Because households are also in debt, right? because if we take out a mortgage, Right? The young graduate takes out a mortgage to pay, pay for the house, so he has a liability toward, the, uh, toward his bank. Right? So this is an asset for the bank, it's a financial asset for the bank, so it's a, it's a household liability. Yeah? But from an aggregate point of view, right, households are providing 2,902 billion euros more than they take out. Financial, uh, Non-financial corporations take out 1,533 billion euros more than they provide to financial markets, for financial uh, corporations is 247 uh, positive net position, 
And then what is interesting for us is, is the government, which has a little bit more than one trillion euros of a negative position. And the rest of the world, right, 457 negative. And so if we express this as a total percentage of net financial uh, uh, savings, right, then households and nonprofits provide 92% of all savings being traded on financial markets in Germany, and uh, financial corporations 8%. How come that financial corporations provide uh, uh, more assets? Well, the, the reason is that um, uh, well, they, they, um, well, okay, I, I will not go into this. Right, so they have, this is somewhat exceptional. In other countries, is, is we, have, uh, we have a different position, right? Because other, in other countries, uh, financial corporations invest to a larger extent also in things like real estate and so on. So the government absorbs on the German capital market, on the German financial market, excuse me, 35% of all available net savings. That's a lot. 35% of all savings are being used by the government, uh, and the government has, has already spent this money. Now this needs a little uh, uh, elucidation that is, will be important for us later on. Namely, uh, the, the question concerns the question, how would we qualify this government spending from an economic point of view? And what I uh, wish to suggest is this, is this all this spending, all the 1,720 billion euros that the government obtained through the financial markets are, from an economic point of view, cons uh, consumer spending, consumption spending. And the reason is that the money spent by governments do not uh, usually earn a return on this investment and are, in fact, not even meant to re uh, earn a return on investment. That's precisely why the government carries out this expenditure. So even if the government builds infrastructure, right, this infrastructure is not meant to earn a return on the investment. Right? The government spends maybe 1 billion uh, euros on, on highways, right? and then even if it uh, sets up a toll system, right, the, the tolls are not meant to uh, recover the 1 billion euros invested. Right? That's not the purpose. And in actual practice, it's usually not the case. Sometimes it is the case, but usually it is not the case. So from an economic point of view then, all the money that the government spends, be it on, uh, uh, as a compensation for uh, civil servants, or be it in infrastructure investments and so on, is consumer expenditure. Now this is important because it means that 35% of all savings being traded on the financial markets in Germany are being invested in uh, things that do not create that revenue. So how does the government pay back these loans? And the answer is very simple, well, through, through taxation. Ultimately, it's the other market participants, households and non-profits, and the firms, both financial and non-financial, that have to pay taxes that the government then will use to serve the debt, right, serve these 35%. So uh, non-financial corporations in particular then, not only serve the capital invested in themselves by their shareholders and by their creditors, they also serve the debt contracted by governments. So the higher this figure, well, the, the heavier is the load falling on the rest of the economy. Now, the, the German case is, uh, is not exceptional. So we, if we look at other countries, we get by and the same picture. Uh, if we look at the United States, uh, Non-financial corpor uh, corporations actually take out 60% of all available savings on the financial financial savings, and government only 27%. So government is, is, is leaner in the United States. In France, as you would expect, uh, it's more than in the U.S. It's rather than in Germany. Right? Uh, in, in France, the the local companies take out more savings than in Germany because uh, the German savers not only finance their own companies, uh, their own firms, but also foreign firms and foreign governments. Okay, 
In the UK, uh, we get the, the following picture. So again, uh, this is the country where uh, the financing of government is, is least important. The particularity in the UK is, as you see, that financial corporations uh, absorb a large chunk of, uh, so a large net consumers of, uh, of financial savings. That's because the financial industries are a major industry in the country. In Japan, finally, uh, the government uh, cons consumes 46% of all savings. So this is uh, for, for us our starting point. Right? We see that in all countries, uh, uh, the government has significantly consumes significantly more than one quarter of the uh, uh, amount of savings being exchanged through the financial markets. And these countries are, of course, especially relevant because uh, these are the biggest capital markets in the world. And I didn't choose Zimbabwe, and, and sorry, I didn't choose Romania, not only because I didn't have the, the, the data. I would love to have the data for Romania, so if somebody can help me out, please do. Uh, but I was especially interested in those countries because that's the biggest capital market in the world, it's the biggest financial market in the world. Right? That's where the meat is. And so we see that even in the countries that are most capitalistic, Right, the U.S., maybe the U.K., U.K. is not really a capitalist country, right, but the government absorbs at least one quarter of all available savings on the financial markets. And President Obama is uh, about to, to change this too, right? I mean, he's, he's getting closer to European levels and will very soon reach uh, Germany and France. Right? And then you have an extreme case of, uh, such as Japan, where the government actually absorbs 46% of our financial markets. Okay. Now, this is, of course, a, f a figure that gets us closer to the institutional reality that we confront on financial markets, right? In the, one weakness of the textbook presentation is to uh, represent financial markets as some sort of, well, so the last uh, resort, right? The, the last uh, living grounds, breeding grounds of free entrepreneurs, unfettered capitalism, and so on, right? The capitalists are riding like cowboys along uh, financial markets. And there's very few government involvement, right? And therefore, all things go wrong on the financial markets. They're very unstable. The fact is that uh, financial markets in all countries, and especially in those very capital-rich countries, are very, very strongly higher, uh, regulated. In fact, I mean, probably next to the public health sector are the most regulated parts of the, of the economy already, and have been already before the outbreak of the present crisis. Moreover, the government is present on financial markets not only as a big customer, as we see here, but also as a big intermediary. Public banks, uh, postal bank, and, and so on, but other banks as well. Uh, half public banks, as, uh, of which we have uh, a lot in France, uh, represent uh, a great chunk of the market participants on financial markets. When the crisis broke out in, uh, in 2007 and it swept over to, to the European continent, the banks that were first concerned were German banks, German public and half public banks with a very large balance sheet. In the US, you have two big mortgage corporations that are now very well known. You have uh, uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. They had, had a, at the outbreak of, of the crisis, a combined balance sheet of some $5 trillion. Five trillion dollars is, uh, well, 1.5 times or so the, the GDP of Germany, or almost two times the GDP of Germany at the time. Okay. So governments are massively present on the financial markets, so we shouldn't be surprised that they are actually one of the, the main actors, main agents on the financial markets. So what I would like to do now is uh, to go through, to walk you through some of the major mechanisms that come here into play. How precisely does the, the government influence financial markets to its benefit? So we'll have a look at what I should call a financial market interventionism. So first, let's start with uh, two definitions. First, the definition of interventionism. Ludwig von Mises has given a famous uh, definition of intervention of an intervention in, in, 1920, in the 1920s. So an intervention for him is a, is a more or less isolated command through which the government uh, orders private property owners to use their resources, their time, their money, right, their uh, re 
factors of production in a different way than these owners themselves would have used them. The important point here is that this is more or less isolated, right? It's not a system. The government does not own everything, and even if it intervenes everywhere, it does not fully control all these resources. Right? It says, well, to an employee, well, uh, excuse me, to, 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 a, to a company, you are free to hire people, but if you hire people, you have to pay them at least this and that amount of money, so minimum wage. Right? So you're buying us, you're, you're free, but you're not completely free. It may impose a price control on interest rates. I mean, you, you may lend money, you, you may borrow money, but you have to pay not more than whatever, 4% interest. It may tell companies, well, you uh, may engage in financial intermediation, but you have to keep at least 8% of equity. So you're free by and large to arrange your things as you wish, but you have to respect certain constraints, so you're not completely free. Which is, of course, the dominant uh, fact of our present uh, economic system, we have an interventionist government system. We don't have a free market economy. So accordingly, financial market interventionism is a particular uh, type of interventionism, uh, and it is distinguished by its objective. It aims at improving the government's bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis its creditors. So give you one example of what financial interventionism is, not is, uh, it would not be a price control. So if the government says, well, uh, the interest rate shall not be higher than 4%, that would not be financial market interventionism according to this definition. Right? Because it does not improve the government's bargaining position. Right? It, it commands people to uh, behave differently uh, than they, they otherwise would. In fact, a price control would, would deteriorate the government's bargaining position. Right? If, for example, Italy said, the uh, Italian government said today, well, uh, we'll impose an, uh, a price control on interest rates of 4% or 3% on Italian government bonds, then very few people would still lend to the Italian government. And right? so it would shoot itself in its own leg. And that's, that's the main reason why price controls are not being imposed on, on financial markets. It's contrary to the objective that the government uh, pursues. So what governments do on financial markets typically is not to intervene in the form of price controls. They intervene by what we call here financial market interventionism. They try to improve their bargaining position vis-a-vis -vis their creditors. Now, why only the creditors? Well. Well, because that's just how, how it is. It, theoretically, it would be possible that governments be run as companies, right? So then they would, be, would have shareholders, right? But in actual fact, well, we, our governments do not have shareholders. There's, if they are, we don't know of them. <laughs> they only have creditors. So what are the, the main instruments of financial market interventionism? Well, it's inflation, forced savings, forced lending to the state, and price rigging, price manipulation. So let's consider these things uh, one by one. Let's start with inflation. Now, I must confess right away that I use the word inflation in a, in a particular sense, right? In a, in a sense that is more closer to the classical meaning of the word, right? Inflation comes from inflare, uh, the Latin word inflare, to blow up. So what is being blow, blown up is uh, is the money supply. It's an artificial increase of the money supply. The money supply is being artificially increased through government interventionism, for example, by imposing an immaterial fiat money. Right? So this is what we have today. We have, we have things like dollars and euros. Right? This is immaterial money, what I call it. It's not completely immaterial because we can touch it and so on. Right? But it's largely immaterial. Right? This costs five cents to make plus or minus two cents, right. and well, it is 20 euros. It's not five cents, it's 20 euros. Right. So the government can impose this on the market, and by imposing this on the market, it can inflate the money supply to a much greater extent than the money supply could increase otherwise. So in most cases, when paper money had or initially been imposed on the market, we typically had before a precious metal monetary system. We had a, a silver circulation or a gold, a gold standard or something like this. 
Right? And gold and silver can, of course, be produced so the money supply increases, right? It's a natural increase of the money supply. But this in increase of the money supply is a few percents, right? something like 5% at most, right? His by historical standards. This can be increased at, at will, right? I mean, it, it costs not much to produce this. And it costs even less, that is virtually none at all, to produce electronic money. And most of our money today in the Eurozone, I guess in Romania it's the same thing, is actually electronic money. Electronic money that is deposits held by, by banks and uh, governments and other market participants at the central banks. Now, an electronic deposit costs nothing to, to make. It's just a click on the, the keyboard. A few clicks on the keyboard, depending on how many zeros you want to enter. <laughs> right? So we can increase the money supply at will, right? There are no commercial uh, or technical uh, constraints, right? This, we can produce as much as we wish, right? From a legal point of view, this is debt, right? It's the debt of a central bank. There's a very particular debt in practice, right? I encourage all of you to have a try, take your a bank note, go to the uh, local office of the central bank, or maybe its headquarters, and you slam this on the table and say, I want to have my money. This is debt, this is your debt, so you should pay me. What does this mean? Uh, it means nothing. Uh, the poor guy at the, at the desk will not know what you mean. True, this is from a legal point of view, it's debt, but that's a legal fiction. It's an accounting fiction. This cannot be redeemed into something more fundamental. Uh, so the poor guy he will give you two tenths, <laughs> right? If you want it all to something else, right? Or maybe if you're particularly nasty, you will cut a 50 in, <laughs> in five fifth parts or something like this, right? So it cannot be redeemed. So this money supply then can be increased at will. And the president of the European Central Bank, or more precisely, the, the governing council of the European of the Euro system has proven in the, in the past six months that there are no limits to this, right? They've, they've increased the euro-based money supply by one-third within a year. They've increased it, right, the balance sheet from uh, about two trillion euros to almost three, or I think now it's probably more than three trillion euros within a year. It's impossible with the gold standard, or impossible with the, with the silver money, okay? So why do they do this? What, what's, why is it interesting for the government to be able to create a money that can be increased indefinitely? Now we get all the stories that we know from the Keynesian Vulgata, right? It's, it's good to have a flexible uh, currency and elastic so money supply and so on. And we'll leave this out of our discussion tonight and we'll focus on one other motivation that is crucial. And the other motivation is that the government actually gains by increasing the money supply. But because by increasing the money supply, we create something that uh, economists call the Cantillon effects. That is, we create a winner-loser phenomenon. We create gains for those people who may use the new money first. They may spend it while the price level is still relatively low. That is, while the purchasing power of the money is still relatively high. And now, as the first beneficiaries spend it, right, their first people who receive it, they go on spend it as well. So prices start rising one by one slowly in a succession a process spread out in time. And so prices, more or less all prices eventually rise. But as the prices rise, there are certain people who have not yet higher revenues. Right? Eventually their revenues will rise as well, but they have not yet. So these people are now paying higher prices. They need to pay higher electricity prices. They need to pay higher gas prices because uh, the guys who used the money before them are already paying at, at the gas station and so on. They pay higher bread prices, higher food prices, more, whatever. Right? So these guys are losing. The first users of the new money win. The later users of the new money lose. And the government and that's not an accident, always belongs to the first users of the new money. That's one of the reasons why governments run banks. That's one of the reasons why governments have set up central banks. That's one of the reasons why the phenomenon of the monetization of the public debt. The central bank hands money over directly to the government. Right? 
So we have this motivation to create inflation. But indirectly, and this is our subject now, indirectly inflation in that very sense, artificially increasing the money supply, also creates a hidden subsidy to fi for financial markets. It does so by uh, promoting fractional reserve banking, right? If you have, for example, an immaterial fiat money, you can refinance commercial banks as you wish, and this is what the central bank is doing right now, right, through repurchase operations, right, the famous, famous repurchase operations, and through uh, uh, permanent uh, uh, credit uh, facilities. Right, so f commercial banks that create themselves money have a larger extent of operations than they otherwise would have had. So as a consequence, these banks can lend more money themselves. The central bank creates maybe, let's say, one trillion more dollars, and if, if the, the banking system is functional, not as it is right now, it's not functional. So usually then the banking system would itself, then based on this additional money that is available, would increase another two, another three trillion dollars. So it can create correspondingly more credits, among other people, to the government. Now the promotion of fractional reserve banking uh, has entailed an invention, intervention spiral, or what is called an intervention spiral, right? because uh, uh, fractional reserve banks are well, virtually illiquid, so they are unstable, they need to be stabilized. That was one of the reasons why we introduced fiat money. And today they have led to uh, the, the outright management of financial markets through the government. The reason why, fin uh, why governments and, and central banks manage uh, financial markets, they try to stabilize financial uh, market prices, is because uh, that's where the assets of, of banks are. Uh, if you want to save a bank, if you, want to, you can do this in various ways. You can, you can bail out the bank. So if we, you have a bank that has just whatever, five trillion, uh, uh, let's say five billion uh, euros losses or five billion dollars losses as JP Morgan recently had, right? uh, one, one solution is to simply hand over this money to the bank. You, right? you, government buys shares from the bank, right? it's a public stake into the bank. That's one way to do it. And as long as only individual banks are concerned, well, you can, this is a, a feasible way, and it has been done for a very long time. Things change if we have a situation as the present one in which financial markets are very, very fragile because banks have not enough equity capital, right? so their, 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 their cushion to absorb possible losses is very, extremely low, extremely narrow. In that case, then, the default of any one bank can very quickly entail spillover effects and entail a, a meltdown of the entire banking industry, in fact, the entire financial market industry. Now, if you get a meltdown, then asset prices might shrink, shrink to one-third of what they presently are, or they might even shrink to one-tenth of what they presently are. So it's no longer possible, well, it's still technically possible for the central bank to bail out the banks then. It's po technically possible. But this would re require uh, multiplying the, the, the money supply uh, by uh, incredible amounts. Just to g give you one uh, illustration. So in the US, for example, the total of financial assets uh, uh, being traded is $150 trillion. Okay? The total volume of all financial assets on US capital markets. Uh, gross volume, not the net figures that we considered before. Now let's suppose they, they shrink to one third, optimistic estimate. They shrink from 150 trillion to 50 trillion dollars. Then the central bank, in order to cover the losses, would have to create something like 100 trillion dollars. And the present money supply, the present base money supply in, uh, in, in the Federal Reserve System is about four or five. Uh, so it would have to increase the money supply by the factor 20, more or less, from one day to another. Okay, so if you want to ruin the, 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 the currency, if you want to create an immediate hyperinflation, that's the way to go. Uh, so therefore, they do not do this. They, the central banks espouse a cheaper way of handling things, 
by trying to prevent the outbreak of a default, of a first default in the first place, right? They try to extinguish the fire while the fire is still small. Uh, so they just have to bail out the current, the, so the operational losses that occur in any period. So the important thing is not to permit a deflationary spiral to set up in the first place. So the way to do this is then by buying uh, securities, also private securities. Central banks have been buying stocks, and not only debt instruments. In the US, this is a practice that is about at least 15 years old, or only 17 years old, and has been institutionalized in the so-called plunge protection team, also known as the, the president's working group on financial markets. So these are the guys that decide which, which stocks need to be bought, which securities need to be bought, because they're sensitive for the balance sheets of, of these or that market participants. Uh, the same buying is also carried out by sovereign funds, sovereign funds, sovereign investment funds, and by, by central banks themselves. And another technique that is widely used today and which uh, will be creating problems that we will hear of more in the future is fictitious business accounting. And one of the first things that we did both in Europe and in the US at the outbreak of the crisis in 2008, we threw overboard all established accounting practices and allowed bank, banks to engage in largely fictitious accounting. That is, the banks may do now, under the toleration of the state, to what would usually be considered to be fraudulent. Right? You own maybe, like Spanish banks, a lot of real estate. There's houses that are empty, no owner uh, who pays a mortgage, uh, no renter, and so on, and they are allowed to keep this on the on their balance sheet at fictitious values, as overblown values. Of course, this is a, is a time bomb for uh, the macroeconomic environment in, in the medium and the longer run. It's a short-term desperado measure that has been uh, chosen in order to stabilize financial markets. Because if banks had been forced to recognize the, the current value, for example, uh, according to the mark-to-market principle, well, it would have entailed the immediate meltdown, immediate default of a great number of banks and therefore meltdown of the financial market. Right. So we get an overblown uh, financial uh, system through these techniques. But inflation also uh, creates uh, other consequences that are important for us. So we get excessive financial intermediation Therefore, uh, th th this is what we have just seen, right? What I walk you through, you through, excessive demand, therefore excessive demand for government securities, right? If, if banks and the financial sector as a whole, financial firms as a whole, are stabilized at an artificially large uh, level, artificially high level, well, then they can hand out more credits than they otherwise would have been able to do, and therefore can also buy more government securities. And in fact, that's what they're doing. But there's also a more indirect road, right? Uh, permanent inflation of the money supply creates also the phenomenon of price inflation, right? You, because you have permanent price inflation, you discourage the hoarding of money, which was one of the main motivations at the time for introducing that system, but I'll, I'll skip this, right? So the basic thing is, if the price level rises every single year by at least two or three percent, Let's say if it rises only by 2%, so we have perfect price stability according to the definition of the euro system. Then after 20 years, the purchasing power of the euro is only half than what it was before. So keeping your savings in the form of cash that you keep under the pillow or that you dug into the, into, into the ground in your garden is suicidal from a financial point of view. Now that's exactly, of course, the main savings techniques of previous generations. That's how our ancestors saved in the, uh, before the 20th century. Cash holding was the main form of saving. You still find today, from time to time, you find a, a grandmother or a granddaddy. Uh, when, when they die, you, you find boxes with, with banknotes and so on because they didn't trust the, the banks, so they kept them at home. It was a very, very bad idea, right, from a financial point of view, but that's what's the usual way of going at this. Now, we, of course, we are instructed, we are accustomed to the system. We know that the money will lose its purchasing power, so we don't hoard money, 
right? we leave it all in the bank. Because we leave it all in the bank, banks have more business to do and they themselves can create more money. Right? So again, financial markets get a shot in the arm. Right? Right? We invest more also, not only we leave more money in the, in the bank, we also invest more money uh, in our attempt to flight from, from inflation, right, or flight into real value. So we buy more real estate than we, we otherwise would have bought. We buy more securities than we otherwise would have bought. And because we buy more securities, well, there's, among other things, an excessive demand for government securities too. Okay, let's turn now to the next form of financial market interventionism, which is forced savings. We need to distinguish here uh, the overall savings volume and the savings invested in securities. And I shall argue at present that what forced savings do is to increase only the savings invested in securities, not necessarily the overall savings. So how do they do this, both in direct and indirect way? The direct way uh, occurs, for example, through mandatory insurance. Uh, so whenever the government imposes a public health system, health insurance system, or public pension system, uh, it forces people to subscribe to such an insurance who would otherwise not have done it. Uh, so more savings are being created by virtue of the government fiat than would otherwise have been the case, so more government securities can be bought. An indirect route could happen as a consequence of the redistributive effects of, uh, of inflation, right? the Cantillon effects. Right? If the, the first beneficiaries of the new money save more than the later ones, then the losers, well, then you get more, more savings. I don't think that this is actually very important in practice, but that's an empirical question. What I think is important is, uh, is this route. Because we, we are living in an interventionist economy in a regulatory state, which taxes and regulates us at all ends of our life, right? the government actually discourages people from setting up their own companies. And as we've just seen by looking at the figures, uh, leaving one's money in one's own company, investing money in one's own company or in the, in the family business or lending money to, to friends and so on, is the main form of uh, in which savings are usually used. So because we discourage this, this route is, is still open, but it's, it's discouraged, so it happens on a lesser scale. Right, so what else do you do? Again, you will not leave your money <laughs> under the pillow, right, will lose its purchasing power, so you, you invest it either in real estate or in financial markets. Now forced lending to the states, uh, to the state, again, uh, occurs both in direct and indirect ways. Um, today, uh, it's very rarely the case that the government forces households and private firms to, to finance it directly. Uh, for example, in France, we had a debate uh, of uh, the uh, 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 a national loan, right, a coercive loan that, that all taxpayers would be coerced to, to subscribe to. Right? That would be a form. It has not, has not actually happened. But that would be a, an example. It right? has also happened in previous times in the 20th century. The government can say, well, everybody needs to subscribe to the new government loan. Right? It would be a forced lending to the state. What is more frequent in practice is the following thing, is to coerce financial intermediaries to finance the state. And concern are in particular social security organizations. Right? So it's one thing for the state to set up a public uh, health system or a public pension system. It's another thing to ask of the, the, this institution to invest its funds in, in government securities. But that's what's actually happening. Okay. So the public pension fund there, where it's uh, based on, a, not on a pay-as-you-go, but on a uh, capitalization basis, invests in government securities. The indirect route occurs through financial regulation. Uh, insurance companies, in particular, are very strongly regulated. Some investment funds as well. Banks, of course, are very strongly regulated. And so the law prescribes that they have to invest this and that percentage of all the assets into uh, uh, either the, the wording is direct into government bonds or it's indirect into assets of the highest uh, gives of course greater importance a greater weight to the 
goods that have lower prices because if uh, the price for a good falls or does not rise quite as fast as the other prices, then consumers will tend to buy more of that good. Right? So this way of calculating the inflation rate understates the effective inflation rate. Right? If you, let's say, uh, right now, let's say we, we buy, in, you buy in your Romania 100,000 uh, uh, Peugeots and you buy um, uh, 100,000 Dacias at a, at a lower price, right? and then the prices of Peugeots double and the price of Dacias only uh, increase by 20%, right? then consumers will buy henceforth 150,000 Dacias and only 50,000 Peugeots. Right? So the weight of the Dacia price increases relative to the weight of the Peugeot price. So the inflation rate does not reflect the actual right, increase of the price level of the two goods, but gives greater prominence to the good with a weaker price. Another technique that has been used is hedonistic pricing. Right? So adjustments made by the statistical office to account for quality changes. A quality change is impossible to measure in practice, so it's just an estimate, so it opens uh, the door for, for manipulations. And another example would be uh, the, the use of quasi rents to uh, estimate the, the, the price changes or the, pr the price level of real estate. And, uh, real estate prices do not enter, uh, for example, in Europe, in, in, the, United, in the European Union, in uh, the Eurozone, in the uh, United States. They do not enter uh, the, the price level computation in the form of the the, the prices of new houses that you buy or of the, of, of the, of the uh, secondary market of houses uh, which you buy, but in the form of a quasi-rent, that is, what is the, the typical rent that I could earn on the, uh, this and that object. Now, in practice, that meant in the past 15 years, in the past 15 years, house price, housing prices have increased very, very strongly until the crisis, right, in the United States, are still at a very high level, and in Europe, in, in Western Europe, it's the same thing. In France, for example, there's a very strong increase of housing prices. But this has not been reflected in the inflation rate because the inflation rate measured only the quasi rent. That is, what, are the, what is the rental price that I could have earned by owning this and that object? And the rental price hasn't moved much. Okay, so it's another trick that helps us to underestimate the inflation rate as compared to the real price increases that are being paid on the market. Yeah, and the final technique uh, that I should mention, uh, because of some current interest, of course, misreporting or lies. Right? Well, we have the scandalous case of Greek statistics. Right? That's an open thing. But, I mean, uh, the government has constantly lied about uh, statistics, not only in Greece, but in, in other countries as well. Right? Governments constantly try to represent their own situation better than it really is. So we always need to discount this factor when interpreting public statistics. Now let's turn to the price rigging of precious metals. Uh, uh, and the exhibit A for us uh, is this, right? So we have, I'll show you here two charts. The first chart gives us the increase of the gold price from 2000, uh, was it 2000 to 2000? Uh, 12, right? during this time there was an almost 600% increase of the gold price, right? widely reported in the news. Now, the second chart shows the evolution of the portfolio of a hypothetical gold buyer who would only have bought gold and sold gold during the trading hours in the United States. This here the hypothesis is you have in 2001, you have, let's say, $100 or $1 million, and at the beginning of the day, you start trading gold, and at the end of the day, you sell all your position, right? You, you sell gold at, at the price of the, of, of the end of the day, and you convert it into cash. The next morning, you, you start again, right? You, you start trading. And you see that this curve, right? So the curve does not rise, it declines. And in fact, right, if we compute uh, the, the price changes during the trading day, we find that the gold price dropped 70% during the same period in which it increased almost sixfold on the overall market. Now this, I, I cannot imagine a stronger proof of market manipulation. This is a, a glaring proof, if there's ever an empirical proof of anything, right, 
as a glaring proof of market manipulation. How can it be that the market increases sixfold from 2000 to 2012, and in the US trading hours, it diminishes 70% during the same time? There's only, you can say there are only stupid guys acting the, the US market, or there's some guy there who just manipulates the market in a way that prices constantly drop overall. Now, why would the government have uh, an interest in rigging the gold price? And the reason is uh, very straightforward. It relates to what we said before about money hoarding. Right? The traditional way of holding savings is to, to hoard money. And gold is a natural money. It's a general accepted medium of, pain, medium of exchange. You can use gold all over the world. You can also use silver all over the world. So it's a natural way of keeping your savings, investing in precious metals. So the government has an incentive to rig the gold market, so to bar this route to investors and give them therefore a greater incentive not to invest in gold, but to invest in something else, securities or real estate, and especially securities, thereby giving greater prominence to the demand for government securities. Now, how has this been done in practice? Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I'll skip this. How this, uh, has this been done in practice? Well, first by using uh, public stockpiles of precious metals. Right? has been very important, especially in the U.S., because the U.S. Uh, government, by 1939, had the highest gold stock ever owned by a government in the world. They owned virtually 80% of all gold existing in the Western world. The reason was that we had a nasty period of conflict in Europe in the interwar years, right? so Europeans were expatriating their gold toward the United States. And there it ended up in the coffers of the government. So the government then could use this gold as a threat, or not only as a threat, but actually to sell it on the markets, thereby depressing prices there. And uh, there, there are two uh, well-known uh, arrangements. One is the so-called London Gold Pool in the 1960s. It was a cooperation between uh, six governments and a few commercial banks that sold gold on the, the main gold market, which was the London market, trying to stabilize the official exchange rate on that market. And the, uh, the second known uh, use of public stockpiles of precious metals today are gold swap arrangements between central banks. Uh, it's also on the public record. So central banks do this today in order to right, overwhelm the market participants on precious metal markets to the extent that it's possible. The second major technique consisted in corrupting intermediaries. Governments have authorized recalcitrant redemptions by financial intermediaries. It's very difficult, for example, certain banks, for example, JP Morgan, who is now in difficulties, offer uh, gold accounts. Uh, so you can buy gold that is then stocked by the bank. And legally, you have the right to reclaim that gold, that is to go to the bank and say, I want to see my gold now. But banks in practice have been very reluctant to hand over the gold. They always want to settle in cash, pay dollars or euros, but never hand over the, the gold. This is a, uh, a, a blatant violation of contract, and we're allowed to do this. Same thing happens on derivatives market, uh, such as the COMEX. You have gold futures, so in principle it would be legitimate and legal right, for the, the, the buyer of a gold future to claim the actual delivery of gold, but it's actually very difficult to uh, realize this in practice. Uh, Chinese investors have done this on the uh, uh, London gold market, uh, but have completely dropped doing this because the last time they tried, uh, that was, uh, I think, in October 2010, they had to mobilize about 100 lawyers to finally e extort some, some of their gold from, uh, the, the, the London, uh, from the London gold market, right, intermediary. So they, they started producing their own gold. Uh, then another way of uh, corrupting intermediaries is to allow on the derivative market very large naked short positions, which is the correct practice and has been the practice for a very long time, and to allow very strong concentrations that would be considered monopolist 
uh, on any other market. So it's authorized, it's tolerated on, on precious metals markets, but not on other markets. It's an anomaly, a glaring anomaly. And it serves at creating depressing the gold price. Finally, this is the last chart on this, right? Uh, a few other, I mean, this is, uh, the other forms of price rigging, right? We have the strategic oil uh, reserve, I think we mentioned this already. Then the threat of seizures and actual seizures. Right? Threat of seizures, why does this depress the price? Well, uh, if, if you own the wrong things, so the wrong alternative investments, uh, and not buy government securities, well, the government might threaten you by, uh, with expropriation. For example, rather than buying US government bonds, you buy Japanese government bonds or Romanian government bonds, and I don't know what, right? then the US government might say, you, you are trading with the enemy. I mean, clearly the Japanese are suspect because we are led already a war against them, and the Romanians, phew, uh, so, so also suspicious people. So we might simply expropriate you. And if there's a credible threat that they might do this, well, this discourages owning such securities. So you go where? Well, you go to those things that are not threatened with expropriation, which is U.S. securities. And there can be, of course, outright seizures that occur in uh, monetary reforms and uh, have also been applied to precious metals, like gold was being expropriated from U.S. citizens in the early 1930s, right? So this, again, discourages henceforth owning gold or owning these or that assets. And investing, rather, in government securities, which are not likely to be expropriated. Okay, you see, this was a, was a long walk, right? I, I thought it might be worthwhile just to, to show the extent and, and the ramifications of these involvements that actually take place. And I think they, they go a long way of explaining this very prominent role that governments play on financial markets. Right? It's difficult to quantify this. It's difficult to say how much of the size of present-day financial markets is due to market forces, right? so the conventional theory that we discussed a little bit at the beginning, and how much is due to financial market interventions. Well, at least as looking at the figures and looking at these uh, factual theoretical considerations, well, we see, well, I mean, they go a long way. So it's a very large part of it that is due to financial market interventionism. So let's conclude by just highlight a few implications of financial market interventionism. The first one is a political implication, right? Financial market interventionism provides the government with more resources than it could otherwise have obtained. Without financial market interventionism, government could not take out as much debt because the interest rate would be much higher, for example, because people would, uh, would have to pay interest rates are way higher. So it would, governments would have to live, by and large, only with tax proceeds. Right? So the, the implication is then that uh, governments grow much stronger through to, uh, due to financial market interventionism, so it brings us to, uh, a long way along, the, along uh, the road of the road to serfdom, right? what Hayek once called the road to serfdom. The economic implications uh, uh, relate to what I said at the beginning about the economic uh, significance of government debt. Right? Government debt is, uh, is spent, uh, is consumed, right? it's not invested, it doesn't earn revenues that could serve to pay back that debt. So the implication then is that if you have a country like in France or in Germany where the government consumes about 35% of all available savings on the financial markets, is that 35% of all these savings are used for consumer credits. Now that's a lot. Just imagine, right, in the case of government, we, we somehow we stand back and say, well, I mean, that, that's not a big deal, and this is the representative of the people. If it were actually handed over to consumers and they bought cars and, and, and iPhones and iTablets and uh, I don't know what, we would grow a little nervous. How do they want to pay this back? And it, of course, we would know, well, they couldn't pay this back. It's impossible. And our governments cannot pay this back either. Uh, and we should be concerned about this, but we are not because there yeah, are various other reasons. But that's, in fact, the implication. Only about a third of all these resources are used, or 40 percent, in some countries, the Anglo-Saxon countries, it's, it's two-thirds, right, are, are used by companies 
and thus can be served, can be used to, to pay back not only the money invested in the companies, but also to pay back the tax, to pay the taxes that the government needs to pay back the loans. Right. It's very different in a country like Japan. Right? Very, very difficult. And then finally, we have the, uh, the, the cultural implications. And again, I cannot walk through the entire thing, but let me just highlight that, of course, giving a government so much prominence and giving it so many resources has enabled uh, governments to play the role of uh, problem solvers of last resort. Not only on the financial markets, but also on the financial markets. On the financial markets, uh, the results have, have become obvious. Right? Governments stand there to assure the stability of financial markets, prevent market meltdowns. The consequence is the de-responsabilization of, of financial intermediaries. So they run down their own precautions. They keep less uh, equity, that is, as few equity as they are legally obliged to, to hold. Uh, they run down their cash, that is, their liquidity positions, which brings me to a point that in, in parenthesis that I always make to my students in Angers. I say, well, if something goes wrong with your studies and you need to become a robber, don't become a bank robber. There's virtually no money in the bank. It's, it's not there. Look at the balance sheet of a, of a bank. You have less than 1% in cash. Why is there less than 1%? It's, it's crazy. As a bank, it's usually that's where the money should be. And in the 19th century, banks, competitive banks, typically had 25% of all their assets was cash. So today, it's, one person, it's less than 1%. Why? Well, because they can obtain it at the, uh, at the desk of the central bank for 1% for annual interest. Not a big deal. Why keep cash yourself? Right. So banks have no longer any liquidity, no longer any cash. They, they try not to have any equity. Right? There are banks that are operating with 4%, 3%, 2% equity. My bank in, in, uh, in Angers, at this, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the central office in Angers, at this big sign, right, our equity is 40 billion euros, was to reassure the clients. We have 40 billion euros. Wow, that's a lot of money. And it's true, it's a lot of money, right? 40 billion euros. <laughs> what they didn't say is that they have a balance sheet of 1 trillion euros, OK? So 40 billion out of 1 trillion, this is 4%. This is nothing. That means that you have an error margin of 4%. You can go wrong by 4%. In practice, you are a genius. Right? <laughs> you make no errors. It's like a mathematician or so, right? It's an error margin of 4%. It's crazy. Why can they operate with 4%? Why they are the geniuses? No, they're not. But they, they have the support of the state and of the central bank which bails them out whenever there's a need. So they reduce their own precautions as far as possible and therefore can earn much more money for themselves if, as long as things go right. right? So clearly here we see the, the ultimate results of this cultural implication. Right? We ca create a culture of irresponsibility and of greed also, indifference, uh, lovelessness, uh, unconcern about what's going on around you. And this was particularly strong in the financial market, but it's not only there. And if you have a welfare state, also financed with uh, financial largesse coming from the financial markets, right, you create the same incentives and the same kind of behavior in the beneficiaries of public health uh, benefits, uh, public pension benefits, and so on and so on. You don't have to worry anymore about raising your children, right, and who will take off care of the wealth of the family and so on, because your future is assured, right? You get the public pension. Why should you worry? Right, so we get cultural implications that reach far beyond the sphere of the economic in which I can uh, barely touch here, right? So the, the overall, uh, my overall hope is that you will uh, have followed me a, a little bit in accepting, well, the, the traditional theory of uh, the economic role, the social role of financial markets is not wrong, but it's very incomplete. Uh, and uh, does uh, not give us a good uh, hold, good explanation of what's actually occurring on the markets, whereas the theory of financial market interventionism gets us much closer to the reality that we actually observe. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>